Now we're ready. Here we go. Monday. It's Monday? Yes, it is. All day. Again. Hey, we're Power and Speed. 908-751-0211. And you know the deal. Facebook, iTunes, like us, share us, all the fun stuff. Now, what if there's a new listener that has no idea what you're talking about? I like that. I'm I'm, I'm going to get on his side. Thanks, Tom. You know. (laughs) I thought it was good. If there's a new listener, I'll figure it out. Yeah, it's kind of obvious. You know, I'm not telling them to like somebody else's podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just get up and leave you motherfuckers here. (laughs) (laughs) Just just, just push the button when you're done. (laughs) Which button? Any of them. Wait, you're going to go outside and wait for your delivery? (laughs) Yeah, that's going to happen. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. So, we got a good show planned tonight. Yeah. And we got to apologize for not getting publicized. There was some miscommunication on our end. Um, Yeah. My fault. Like usual. I'm a mess. You know that Lawrence O'Donnell thing? Yeah. That's me. <laughs> Somebody just put no, no volume on a mixer, so we're, are we broadcasting or? We should be. Hmm. Hang on. Let me see here. Make sure you're not failed. Two of them. Three of them. All right. Hang on. Yeah. Looks like perhaps Studio One crashed. Ooh. Great. Sweet. Well, no, it's, everything's recording. Everything's right. fine. Uh, we'll just try it again. Let's see. All of a sudden, everything will pop into place, and then they'll be able to hear us. Start the whole thing again? <laughs> no. Take two. No. Take two. We've oh. got everything. Okay. What'd they miss? Nothing. Nothing. Tad, tad being they, stupid. They missed, yeah, what? <sighs> they'll hear it. Yeah. So, uh, like we were saying, we, we kind of blew it for getting the, the show link posted as far as who was going to be on, but Tom, who do you have arranged for us, us this evening? Oh, uh, we have Eric Dillard from ProLine Racing. Um, you guys probably know who that is. Uh, they still have no sound. Yes, they do. Oh, I can see the sound going out. Oh, there they go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see the sound going out. All right. So, uh, for everybody that's listening who didn't have sound 20 seconds ago, uh, we were just talking shit about you guys. (laughs) No, actually we weren't. Um, tonight's show is going to feature Eric Dillard from ProLine, uh, the owner of ProLine. You guys all know who ProLine is, correct? I would hope so. Yeah, I think they do. Hey, Jack shit's on. <laughs> Just saying. Is that FUD? Because he doesn't know Jack shit. <laughs> no! Sure. I think that's, a, that's what I said last time Jack shit was on. No. Yeah. Just common theme. Yeah. The one thing we got to say is, man, this thing in Las Vegas is horrible. Oh, yeah. I mean, not forget, I even said that I'm not going to go down the political road with any of this stuff anymore because it's exhausting. Yeah. To be honest with you. I'm yeah. just, I'm really kind of done. And it shouldn't it. be done in a situation like this. No, no, it shouldn't be. Um, although certain people have okay. used it as a battle cry. Of course. But we don't need to get into that. But it's it's just fucking horrible. And I mean, I'm a gun guy. I'm um, a gun guy. Uh, I mean, you know, I was watching stuff come across Twitter that like, well, why should somebody own more than one gun? Mm-hmm. Why should somebody have more than, a, you know, 50, you know, rounds? And even that's too, I mean, like the, the stuff that the... And you know what kills me when you look on Twitter? They're idiots with like cartoon characters yeah. as their background yeah. or yeah. their avatar. Yep. Or they've got those stupid, and again, because I'm new with the internets as far as the social stuff goes, they got these stupid bunny ears on and puppy yeah. dog. I mean, yep. th- I guess that comes from Snapchat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. stupid facial crap. Whatever. Look, you can't, you know, I, I would love to engage one of these people and have a serious discussion about what they're talking about, but how well, the, the, the fuck? There's, there's your first mistake. Yeah, well, how the fuck do you talk to some idiot with with bunny ears? dog yeah. ears or bunny ears and or a dog nose? Out. And the nose, yeah, yeah, I know. And that's probably the same same woman who says, oh, yeah, you can buy hand grenades in Las Vegas. <laughs> That is one I did get. I know. Crazy. But it's, look, I, I feel really bad for all the people out It's there. awful. It is completely awful. And the worst thing is, I know exactly where that is. Like, yeah, to the too. square me foot. Me too. I know exactly Bingo. where it is. Well, we stay right next to it. So, well, almost. Monte Carlo's across, across the street, kind of. But it's close. Yeah, and it, it's creepy. Like, I look at that, and I'm like, man. <gasps> you know, it used to be, like, if if you didn't go to one of these places, you, you saw it, and you're like, yeah. Yeah, I can see, you know, shooting taking place, but when it's... Yeah, and you've been there. When you've been there and you can put yourself there. Yeah. yeah creepy. It is creepy. I've stayed at Mandalay Bay. Have you? Yep. I did, I I think, did we stay there? No. We stayed there. They have a really good gym, so we stayed there for a couple of years. We stayed at the Luxor once, which is right next door, I think. Um, but Mandalay Bay is nice. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. It's older nice, right? Like Kind of like uh, Bellagio? 
Yeah, it's not been redone. Like, it's in like a while. classy, nice. Yeah, not like modern, nice. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. And it is pretty old. It's older than people think. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's just awful. All the shit that's going on. I mean, everything. We got Puerto Rico just annihilated. Uh-huh. We we've got the the southern portions of the United States annihilated. I mean, we're just becoming desensitized to all this stuff. Yeah. Well, and people trying to blame the president type BS, you know. It's no like, politics, yeah, Dad, because yeah, you get me yep. started down a bad road. Oh, yeah. Bad, bad road. You know, it does suck, though, that that guy's dead, so they can't get into, like, can't psychoanalyze him and find out what his major malfunction is. You know, it's just like what what tripped them off. You know, and I was but, talking to, to Alan about this, our, our very own FUD. And why? He doesn't even have a brain. No, I, I know. Sorry. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's kind of, well, it's better than talking to yourself. That's true. Okay. You know, because once in a while you get something back. Yeah. And I, I can't, for me, I think things have gotten markedly worse. I think, you know, like from, I think about everything that occurred and it's not that I'm getting older mm-hmm. and I'm taking everything more seriously. Mm-hmm. It just, it seems like the overall level of hostility is higher. It seems like the amount of incidents of problems are higher. Is it population density? Are people getting dumber? I mean, wh- what the hell's going well, on? Well, you know, people are definitely getting dumber. There's no, I mean, l- let's just think about the phone call you just got from <laughs> oh, Lowe's. Yeah, that's a whole nother. <laughs> I mean, that girl, her IQ might have been like seven. All right, r- real quick. I got, I ordered uh, one, of, one of the people that lives in one of the, the Some places. Some stuff. It, it's a tenant. And I, got, I had to get something. And they had to deliver it. Yeah. It was an appliance. It went bad. I got to replace it. My deal. Um, in the, in the Lowe's order form section, it gives you details like, you know, wh- where's it going? Who do we contact to arrange delivery? So I don't, I like everybody else, mm-hmm. the guy's phone number is my phone. I don't know it. So I had to make the, the effort to go look it up, to put everything in so they could contact him. They called me from Lowe's to tell me this gets, and then I, we got this woman on the phone and all, everybody was here listening and she's like, is everything okay? We order. I'm like, no. There's a place on there to call the other person. You need to call him. And then she just went right back. Is everything okay with your order? Yeah. Like she got stuck. And then the worst thing is she says, well, I see here that I should call so-and-so, so-and-so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, what I said like four fucking times. Yeah. So why are you calling me? So is it just people have gotten that dumb? Well, yeah. And then she said, okay, well, is there anything else I could do? No. <laughs> and you were like, No. You just said, yeah, stupid fuck. Call him, call this guy. And I got Tom over here who's like, uh, well, what'd she ask? My phone number? And yeah. you go, seven. <laughs> <laughs> no, your customer number. Yeah, customer number. Seven. Real nice. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we do sympathize with everything that happened in Las Vegas. And it's horrible. It shouldn't happen. Um, the gun debate, whole nother issue uh, that I, I don't think we should ever really get deep into because there's nothing we're going to do about it. Some people want to keep them. Some people don't. If you're not shooting anybody, I think you can have whatever you want. My view. So, yep. I guess, uh, I guess we'll see what happens. I just hope we find out why this guy did this. Well, hopefully there'll be some stuff on his. Well, did they get his, they catch his, uh, woman that, the Asian woman that left him or whatever. She didn't do anything wrong. No, she, no, she didn't, but did she have any clue? As no, what, she was in know, the, she just, she's in the Philippines or something. She's right. not even here. Hmm. They'll get his laptops and his computers. They'll figure something out. Yeah. I mean, he traces pe- his Facebook history. Yeah. I just, it, it just sucks. But I, I feel so bad for those people because I couldn't even imagine being in that situation. All right. Mr. Lee says, meh, cars now. Cars now. Okay. All right. First of all, knuckleheads. Should I punt him? I would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, so Eric at Proline is on tonight and, uh, you know, it'd be good if you guys have some questions lined up. Uh, I don't know what you want to know. I mean, Proline is, uh, uh, they're at the top of their game. They've been for a long time. And uh, I know Eric personally. He's a really good guy. And he's actually uh, younger than I anticipated, isn't he? Yeah, I didn't ask him how old he is, but he's young. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's pretty impressive. Yep. And you said the the very first time out in a in a Pro Mod type vehicle, shh, he, shh, shh, uh, shh. we can't talk about that? No, it's content. Okay. All right, we'll let him talk content. about it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. shush me sorry how dare you tad i did find the uh grudge race tv show really yes it it does exist on mav tv or something no it's on cbs it was on cbs what was it oh yeah i've seen that yeah with uh willie b 
the host. Spon- yeah, as the host. It is so bad. It's almost like Pink's again, but you it's know. worse than Pink's. <laughs> it's. Did you ever see it? No. It's unbelievable how bad it is. It's 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 unbelievable. I I couldn't get. I watched it for literally like forty five <laughs> seconds. I couldn't watch it anymore. It's like watching that. Did you ever see that movie, Horrible Bosses? <laughs> no. Well, well, the second one, the first one was actually pretty funny, and Jennifer Aniston's in it, which is oh, that's why I told you know. Yeah, but uh, the second one was so bad you had to turn away. Well, that's how this show is. the The host is so bad, it's awful. Well, especially them. Th- okay, what do you want from that guy's? I want a steering wheel and his hood. Well, that's uh, that's know? right. You were telling yeah. me about this while I was waiting at Delicious for a pizza. <laughs> it was, it was- I, I went down Retard Highway with Tad, and I was like, I'm trying to pry out of him. Tad, where did you see it? I don't know. I said, well, were you watching it on TV? Yes. Well, I mean, wh- where did it come from? From my TV, Mike. And I'm like, oh, God. And it, he finally, he figured out, you know, because he, he, now he got, I got him uh, onto the PlayStation View instead of his cable thing. So he actually has this whole wide range of television he can watch. Now. Right. And I guess it was on M- NBC Sports, huh? Yeah, it's it's just... It was as eh, never mind. But he he was he was telling me that the guy wanted to drill holes in another guy. Oh, no, he he rims. did after he won the race a super against the Nova, and the super wins. What and then the he goes fuck over and he takes does a, that have to do? He takes do? a drill and he drills hole, rip, holes in the rims. Don't worry, you can weld them up. I was what? Like, but but why? Yeah, why? what the fuck you know? does that have to do with racing for, well, for money? Well, because you won, so now you have you can take your revenge on the guy. So I was like, well, what the hell? My revenge would be to have the money that was in his pocket is now my money in my pocket. Yeah, but they're yeah. not they're not doing that. That was a pink or whatever. It's it, terrible. It's, yeah. it's terrible. We're giving him too much time. Okay. On the air, actually, it's that bad. Really? Oh. Okay. Well, the the thing that was on Mav TV was supposed to be with Mike Murillo, right? And who was the other guy? You knew who the other guy was. Yeah, Mike Murillo and um I had exactly the same problem last night. He was the night. guy from the other show. Um Pastime. No, no oh, oh Ken Oh Ken Herring. Herring, Herring. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was the one who was gonna be on Mav T V, but yeah. I guess that never went anywhere. Never happened. Uh, I, I don't know why. They were filming. I know they had events. I never saw it. Because they never got enough sponsorship or something. Something. Well, I think well, the- actually Street Outlaws really blew up right around that time. Yeah. So maybe they just got, you know, crushed or uh, who knows? Who, we, we don't know the TV world. Just weaseled out. Yeah, we should. We should be on TV. Not a chance. <laughs> somebody said, uh, somebody said, you know, put a t- TV studio on to do this. And I'm like. Hey, yeah, Mike, you got, you got the cash for that, right? I was like, do you realize what we're talking about to do it right? I mean. Well, th- there he goes. Do it right. I want. He'd need the right, the right exhaust housing for sure. <laughs> well, You're going to start with that again. Yeah. <laughs> huh? <laughs> No, I mean, I I try with everything I do to do it right. Why don't you just let Alan design it? <clears throat> no. No, but you understand what I'm saying? It would just, it'd be good enough. Good enough. We'd have, there it is. We'd good have, enough. We'd have Kodak disposable cameras. We'd have, and snowball microphones. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I spent a lot of time to get the studio where I wanted and functioning like I wanted, and the television thing would be the same thing, or, or a video thing. And I mean, the level of YouTube and web mm-hmm. content that you see now, it's getting better and better. Yeah. yeah. Like I watched that Crowder guy. He had something on the other day about something. Uh, I think it was about those idiots, the, the Antifa guys or whatever. But he had something. I, it was so well produced. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, but you could do that with, um, really, I'm not even kidding. And Tad will back me up on this. You could do that with GoPros. Really? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, 1320 video. Have you seen their recent stuff or, or um, you know, that racing channel? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really good. Well, it, if you look at Adam Carolla. He's just, they're all sitting there with the camera on him, basically. Yeah. It's nothing big deal. With we them. should do that. Listen, everybody knows you look like a homeless guy already. What's the difference? <laughs> the first couple of shows, I'd be fucking trimmed up, suit on. Yeah, right. They'd be like, what the fuck really? It'd be really funny about? if you're all pimped out in some kind of crazy colored tuxedo <laughs> or some shit with a big velvet hat. Yeah, that's not uh, not exactly me. I'm just me. I'm just like any of your other car guys. Tad would wear a velvet hat. I would. Okay. No? No, uh, one like Lemmy used to wear. I don't know who that is. Oh, he doesn't know who so you moved. You're at your oh, house. Oh, my God. Yeah, I moved. Did you find any interesting car stuff when you moved? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did, actually. I found a, a single ring piston that we made long ago. Um. I found a Holly spark plug that I got from Holly somebody. Yeah, plug. yeah. Think about how old that thing is. Oof. Holly spark plug in the box. I don't even remember that. Yeah, you know, I, I don't either. I only have it because somebody gave it to me, and it's cool. Um, what else? 
uh, what did I find? <laughs> I found those two books I told you about. I yeah, can't, I can't see. We don't need to talk are. about them. Yeah, um, it's a weapons thing. It's not a bondage thing. Right yeah, 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 yeah. That's or how to tune your car. Yeah, I know you found uh, a pile of calipers. <laughs> <laughs> it's really crazy, and I have them. Uh, the sizes I have are. I told you, I think I have one that's fourteen. Yeah, and I'm like, what? What? What could that possibly be for? And you said measuring deck height. Yeah, deck height. Yeah. About the only thing you'd ever use that I. <laughs> yeah. What else would you use it for? Yeah. I have a, I forget how many it was. I think it was 11 or nine. It was a lot, a lot of calipers, but, um, tools. It's ridiculous how many tools I have. And actually, you know, not as many as like a pro mechanic would have, but I mean, triples and quadruples of, of a lot of stuff. Did you pitch anything? Not tools. Old Camaro stuff or anything like that or not? Uh, yeah. A couple things, a couple stupid things, but for the most part, nah. I, I, that's one thing I have a hard time throwing away. But nothing real good. No. Yeah. No. I did find that powder coated turbo stuff that I was going to give you, but you, I guess you don't. Powder coated turbos? Oh, for him. Yeah. It's a, a 20, a 20 G. Not a I'm open. Okay. I, at this point, I'm, I just want to get oh, I thought we on the getting, road. I thought we were getting the Cobb thing. All right. Well, we'll yeah. talk, we'll talk yeah. about that. Um, all right. Well, Looks like we got a caller. Hey, Eric, you're on the line, man. Hey, what's going on? We're just doing our thing. How are you, sir? Good, good. I, I gave your introduction before, but in case anybody just tuned in, this is uh, Eric Dillard, uh, the owner of ProLine Racing. Um, really glad to have you, man. Um, how's everything down there? Good, man. Good. Just got the kids to bed. Well, sort of. Got them ready for bed. Did my, did my duty so I get them on a phone call. Good. So, uh, no, everything's good. We're getting ready for Ducks Race, and um, had some customers just call me. Right but right when I went to dial you, had some customers call. They just landed in Atlanta Airport from Australia. So just, uh, um, you know how that race is. It's, it's uh, definitely one of the, we call it race week. That's yeah. the only one we have. It's like a festival. Yep. So, yeah, and, so we're, it's always fun. And that's this weekend, right? Yeah, yeah, they're down there. You know, most of the teams are already there. You can test starting tomorrow. So it's. It's an all-week affair. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I've, uh, I've wanted to go to that for years, and uh, every every year it conflicts with that Florida 2K race, which is like an import yep. versus domestic that's big for us, so I'm leaving for that on Thursday. Oh, cool. But I'm going to have to skip out on that and go to Ducks Race one of these years because... Uh, oh, you it, definitely got to check it out. I know. it's. I I see it's gotten... It's e- huge. Enormous, yeah. It's yeah. more than huge. It's enormous. Like you said, enormous. Yeah. It's gigantic. Yep. So good for him. Yep. So, Mike, introduce yourself. Uh, my name's Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, you know, really good friends with Anthony DeSoma, so I'm familiar with you guys. Oh, cool. So, uh, yeah. I because I mean, I I've been out of this end of things for quite some time, uh, but I'm I'm definitely going to enjoy talking about the business and what Proline can do for people because I I completely relate. Yeah, Eric, Mike's dad. Oh. Mike's dad was a, um, a a famous engine builder way back in the day he was a he specialized in stock and super stock and uh and was also a, a world champion super stock no oh yes yeah, yeah. the guys are oh, yeah i mean we got yeah, that's right we got <laughs> wally's in in the studio very cool yep so uh and mike built engines for a long time and did pretty good pretty well it's, it's actually how we became friends but um i was telling these guys i've known you for a long time um you know basically when you were working there and yep. then one day uh, you own the joint. Yeah. I mean, I, yep. I know I oversimplified it, but tell us the, uh, kind of the chronology of that. So, yeah, I, I, um, I did a lot of, I grew up, you know, just in the cars, loved it from day one and, uh, nobody in my family was in the car. So I was kind of on my own and in high school, um, I got my first Mustang. I think I actually started with an IROC Z and, uh, that was the first thing I could afford. So, uh, um, I, I moved on to a Mustang and when I got a Mustang, I kind of, you just knew about the lynch mob crowd because where we lived at the time, they were, man, they were 15 minutes up the road from me, but you know, they were just iconic even back then. So this would have been, you know, 2000, 2001. Um, and when you go to the local drag strip, which is still open at that time, they closed it down now, you know, Steve and Tim were always there with some kind of street car, race car playing around. And I had always just looked up to them. So I kind of got to know that crowd and um, started getting them to work on my car some and do some stuff for me and ended up getting a job at a dealership 
where they would go and get all their cars dynoed. So at, at that time, there was only one chassis dyno kind of in Metro Atlanta and uh, that, that a lot of people used. And that, that was at this place called Marietta Ford. And I was going to college, started my first semester, and I was, uh, I was a tech um, helper in the transmission department at a Ford dealership. So I'd just come in in the afternoons and on my off days at school and pull trainees in and out of cars. And then I'd hear the dyno running, and I'd run up to the top of the hill. And uh, we were down in a lower used car dealership is where the trans department was. And I would run up to the new car dealer. And uh, usually if you heard the car, if the car's dyno went late in the afternoon, Petty was there tuning somebody's car that he'd built the motor for. And they came into town for Petty to tune it and go to the racetrack. So wait a minute. So, so the dyno was used to for diagnostic and then used for performance, like when he could. Correct. <laughs> yeah, and Marietta Ford was known for its performance side. So. It, oh, okay. So they were like one of the dealers that did a lot of the, yeah. the in-house performance upgrades. Yeah, 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 got it. They were one of the motorsports dealers. So, and they they always loved obviously for Steve to come down and bring all these turbo small blocks and stuff. So the guys just everybody loved it down there. So. I kind of would always go up there and pry and ask questions. And I was that annoying kid that was bothering Steve and, um, Steve likes company. So about, I'd say three, four months into it, he had to drive up to Charlotte to uh, go buy some used NASCAR parts. Cause that was back still in the day when everybody would still go buy Yates heads and, you know, use small block Ford blocks from red, that guy up there. Yep. In Charlotte. Mm-hmm. So he asked me one day, uh, Hey man, you want to, I need, I need, you know, he, like I said, he likes company. So he's like, Hey, why don't you ride with me up to Charlotte? So I skipped work, skipped school, and I was going to Charlotte. So we made a trip up there, just me and him, and came back and went back to work the next day. And he called me the next day and said, hey, man, why don't you come up to the shop and um, start helping me out? So at that time, Steve had gotten to a really bad car accident. And this was probably around, say, 99, 2000. And he was a tech at a Marietta um, Ford, I mean Marietta Dodge. So he was a down the street at another dealership, kind of when I was at one, you know, at the time. So he was doing tech and build motors at night and racing with him and they'd already made a name for themselves at that point so when he when he uh got into that car accident he had to obviously sit out of work for a while and he really couldn't go back and be in a tech it had messed his hip up and he was trying to recover well he used to get all his machine work done at barnett which was some some of the guys out there might know barnett performance but they're kind of like a a small version of jegs or summit just in our local area and uh doug my business partner today was the machinist at Barnett Performance. He was the head machinist. Well, Steve would always get his work done there. Well, one day, even after he got hurt, the Barnett family decided to shut the machine shop down because they felt like it was too much of a, you know, just too much of a hassle. They just decided to do it for their personal stuff, and they put Doug, my business partner, on the counter. And Doug's not a people person. He's a machinist and just wants to be in the back and left alone. So um, Doug was, Steve was looking for somewhere to do machine work. So he found a local shop near us, which is where we all came about. So this shop he went there to get machine work done they asked him if he could stay and maybe hang out a little bit since he didn't have a full-time job and help him bring some work in and before you knew it he was managing the place and then the first person he called because he knew how good a machinist he was was doug and doug didn't even hesitate because he was tired of selling parts to people over the counter so doug drove up and got a job and then 30 days later is when i met steve and i got the job so us three as a core that's where it all started and it took about two years. Some other guy owned the business. Um, the guy was into completely different things. He was in a tile business and all kind of other stuff. The machine shop was more of just kind of a hobby because he got into some dirt track racing and stuff. And um, just one thing led to another, and the company ran out of money. And just nobody really doing anything intentionally. It just, you know, just didn't, didn't have a knack for it. And the owner wasn't paying much attention to it. And um, his other business fell apart. And, um, I was kind of standing there as a 19 year old kid and loved every minute of it and didn't want it to go away and went and talked to Doug and I had to pretty much beg Doug because at the time yet again, he's the guy that just wants to sit back and work. So owning a business really wasn't, uh, on the top of his agenda. So I promised him that he'd never have to worry about, you know, dealing with customers on the phone. He could just do his job as a machinist. Now, how old was, how old was Doug at the time? Doug at the time, he's 50 now. So at the time when we really started talking about this was 2004. So he would have been, what, that would have been 13 years ago. Mm-hmm. So 37. Yep. And um, I was 19, 20 at the time. And he uh, finally got him to commit and um, ended up paying off. We gave the guy $5,000 to walk away that owned the business before. And I went to my 
um, mom and dad at the time. They're both just, you know, just working people. And they, uh, I had a really nice street car at the time that I worked really hard to build and my mom had helped me with it. And, um, I went and parked it in their garage and handed them the title and told them I each needed a $10,000 loan from each of them. Um, and they gave it to me and Doug had about 15,000 at Home Depot stock. That's all he had to his name. And we took that 25 grand and, um, well, 35 grand and, uh, started ProLine. That is so crazy. It, uh, we had about, when I first got into it and tried to, you know, really research all the debt because there was no computer system. It was kind of ran out of a toolbox. There was a lot going on. I mean, we had a lot of customers. Steve had a really good name. At that point, nobody had been taken advantage of or didn't get what they paid for. It was just all starting to come to that point. And Tom probably remembers because he probably remembers me working through all this. But, yep. you know, I really researched all the people and, you know, made all the phone calls of what I thought was there at the time. And it was about 150 to $175,000 worth of work that the parts had been paid deposit on or the labor had already been paid but never been rendered. Ugh. So we knew that, okay, we got 175 to pay back. Well, by the time all the smoke cleared, the vendor debt that was still out there a little bit, 30-day stuff, it ended up being probably a quarter million. And um, we just worked. I mean, at the time, I didn't have a girlfriend or nothing going on. I was neither to Doug, and we just worked seven days a week. We'd get there in the morning at 7, 7.30, and we'd work till 10, 11, 12 when we got tired and go home. And we just did it seven days a week for really the first year and a half, two years, because we had to work double time to finish a job that we needed to finish. And then we had to work that extra 40-hour week to pay for the job that had already been paid for. Yeah. Yeah. So it took us about two and a half, three years, but you know, we, that's what we did to buy that business. Cause it was worth something. It was worth, it had a lot of value. It had a good name. It had Steve behind it. It just, it, it if we wanted to continue it, that's what it was going to take. And me and Doug were willing to do it and kind of we're in a position in our life where we could. And we ended up, you know, just working hard and, and, and getting ahead of it. What did it have for equipment? I mean, was it like a functioning shop it was it was a functioning shop it had all your basics it was it was like a sun and kind of a sun and kit where you had you know your bore hone balancer you know a mill lathe um vgs 20 you know cylinder head machine um rod hone just all your basics to where if you needed some lifters board or you needed something else you had to go down the street but we had everything it took to do the basics and we were yeah. in a very small shop we assembled the engines 10 feet from the machine shop in the same room yeah. you know it's just all we had to work with. Yeah, and where the and where they are, they they, they had um, some assets around, you know, machine guys that were, were really high end. Yeah, they're good guys to farm stuff out yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could have gone to Kazi for really good stuff, or you know. Yeah. Yeah, but, but man, five k. If you get in the into that for five thousand, it must have uh, must have had a lot of paying off to do with customers and stuff hanging. And and he didn't want all those customers chasing him down because he knew what it was going to come to yep. between all the vendors, the equipment, the customers. And we pretty much gave him five to say, look, we're not going to assume liability. We're going to start another LLC, but I guarantee you I'm going to work as hard as I can to make sure you'll never hear about this again. And he didn't. So mm. it, it really, it really worked out, but it was because of the team, you know, it was me, Steve, Doug, and Steve, Steve didn't want to own the business. He wanted to be the tuner, the consultant. He didn't want to deal with that side of it. And we've, we've really done well together as a team to make sure we manage that, you know, 15 years later to where, because we met each other in 02 and, and now here we are in 17 and, you know, holding on to that, you know, in this industry that long, when you have a guy running the business, the engine builder, the tuner, and trying to keep all those egos and personalities and everything whole for that long. That's been my, my job the whole time is just trying to make sure that we all stay true to each other and communicate well. And we've had plenty of blow ups and plenty of things, but just making sure we've never let that come. To, to pulling us apart as a team. Yeah. It sounds like there were a lot of, yeah, you know, all, all the decisions you made way back then were, were the right ones. And, you know, just the, the blood, sweat and tears that made it all happen. And it's a tough business. Yeah. It, it's not, it don't let people think that, you know, you just, oh, I'm going to make millions cause I'm going to, this is a tough business. Yeah. It's not easy. No doubt. I try to, I try to explain that to a lot of people still this day because we've worked so hard to really worked at, at keeping a good name and really standing behind our product and, We've, we've, I felt like we've, that's one thing that I've, I've really worked for, but I try to explain to people every day, like ProLine's got a big name and we're very fortunate enough to have a lot of good clients and good employees to be able to do stuff all around the world. But it's still a very, very hard business. You know, it takes a lot of attention, a lot of detail. Look, I know all businesses do, but you're moving a lot of money because race car parts are, are so expensive now on very low margins. 
and you really have to stay on top of it. That's the other thing from the business right. perspective that people don't understand. I mean, like in, in the business that I'm currently in, uh, margins can be anywhere from 50 to 100%. Yeah. And like, right. I think back to selling, you know, race parts. I mean, like, wow, man, I can, I can clear 15 on this one solid. <laughs> and I was yeah. like high fiving. It hadn't changed much. Yeah. Yep. It hadn't changed much, you know. Really hasn't. So it's crazy. So, um, so let, let's let's get back into memory lane a little bit more and talk about Outlaw Ten Five. I mean, uh, you were there through all that, and you guys basically, you know, when Tim was driving the car, you owned it. Like you, you literally owned it. It was it was crazy. I mean, Steve and Tim, that duo together was was so competitive. Steve was so good at what he did. Tim was very big on you know maintaining the car, how he drove. Um, pushing vendors and making sure they had the latest products, um, testing all the time. And they, they did it on a, between the two of them. When they were, when they were dominating 10, five, honestly, they were doing it with each of them making 45, 50 grand a year, yep. you know? Yep. And, and it was, it was epic. Like they had a 30 year loan on their RV and they had to trade a car to trade a car, to sell this, to do that. To, I mean, it was such a, it was so cool to see it going on because they were doing it out of the garage at Tim's house, which was a lot of those stories in Ten Five back then. Yeah, a lot of that was that way, you know, which is what made it so cool back then. And I think a lot of us look back on those days, and you know, you just you just loved every minute of it. But they they did. They worked hard at it, and they got to a point there for a while when they had the support of Proline, and we, you know, we were able to start moving more product and even getting more vendor support that they could continue still competing at a little bit higher level with the Mobleys. And with those, you know, teams that were getting on up there where they had some budgets to race with, um, they were still holding their own. And I just remember back in, let's just say 2008, nine, I mean, if they didn't break, they won. They yep. had to have broke something yep. to not win the race, which was just really cool. And I, I love remember, hearing that because like, that's, that's exactly where you want to be. If we don't break, oh, we're yeah. winning. That's awesome. And most times it was by it was by a lot. Like there wasn't a lot of close. There were some close, but no. they were dominating. Yeah, if they were on it, they were on it. Yeah, and I, I remember like 2010. I want to say, you know, they went 402 in 2010 with the current rules that we have today. <laughs> yeah. And what's so crazy about that is like you look at Shakedown a few weeks ago, and low ET before the final was a 403. You know, um, and it's just it's just crazy to think back seven, eight years ago, they would have been number one qualifier at today's shakedown race in the same rule format. It's just wild to even think, but that's how dominant they really were. They were, they worked hard at it and they were that good at it. Now, did that particular class set in motion a direction for the business or was the business already going in a given direction? They, Tim and Steve doing their small tire fun forward and getting started in 10 five is what really got the, the name out there to where we could build on top of that. So that whole small block forward air and fun forward, and that's where we started 10.5 was with a small block forward. Um, outlaw 10.5 is really um, between fun forward and the street outlaw thing back then, and then growing into uh, into 10.5, that built the business up to where when me and Doug took it over, that was the base we had was, was 10.5 racing. 10.5 and limited street, that, that was a true 10.5 class at the time that, that I pushed really hard with with a client from like 2006 to 11. Those mainly ten five, and then Lemon Street helped as well, and we kind of built our market off that for that first five years. So uh, you guys were also very into developing uh, or helping develop turbochargers for Precision, weren't you? Yeah. See, when we when we met Precision, it was still a Garrett Turbo. He was just a Garrett dealer. So when we met Precision, they they were still just taking a Garrett Turbo and a reseller. And then as we you know as we were doing business for them. It became, went from a GT4788 to, you know, years down the road, a ProMod 88. And slowly they put their own impeller wheel or their own exhaust housing or their own compressor cover, and it morphed into Precision Turbo, where before it was no different than me reselling a Precision Turbo in the beginning. Right. Um, and they, we, we helped them through all that development. Like Tim and Steve were the first ones to put twin turbos, like in heads-up style racing. I, I remember it specifically on the old shredder Mustang, you know, when they put it on that small block Ford, they were the first one to be like, Hey, can we just run two of them? Well, yeah, let's try that. Yep. You know I mean? Yeah. And it's funny. I remember that too. Cause everybody had big singles. They were making singles up yep. to one fourteen and one sixteen, And 
And then, yeah, you guys yep. had the twin, the twin look out, out the grill and turned everything upside down. Yeah, and I'm not going to say you always hate saying the first, but they were they were one of the first to do that for sure. Um, and it, and it, it kind of turned the corner and the power level went from, you know, where one turbo would have made 1,800 to 2,000. And all of a sudden, we had to start building motors to make double the power. Yeah, so, giant leap. You know. Yeah, overall, yep. one giant leap. Yep. Yeah, and I, I remember, man, I remember sitting in stands watching some of the stuff, and you'd watch their car go down the track, and everybody talked about track. And I'm not, I'm going to ask you to admit anything, Eric, but they talked about track control and all kind of stuff, and the car looked like it was it was a movie because it was just so yeah. much different than anybody else's. Mm-hmm. All kind of yeah. shit going on, and it would just, and he would drive it like a, he's a maniac. I mean, I still oh, he's a maniac. Yeah, you, you still talk to Tim, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we still we still all stay in some sort of contact. Um, we vote different ways. He's went more into the street market on the half mile shootout stuff. Yep. He built a really nice shop at his house and has really got serious into that. And, you know, we stayed down the drag, drag race path. And a lot of it's just because it just, it outgrew us of what we had and financially and what we could do. It outgrew, you know, it became way more of a, of a financial commitment to support what was going on. And I think, I think Tim and Steve and everybody knew that, okay, you know, it's our time if we're going to sell all this stuff and, walk away from it with something to show now is the time yep yeah i still i still talk to tim quite a bit actually yeah he probably gets parts for you for all yeah. the stuff he's doing yeah he does yep. he does but um no it's good you guys are all on on you know at least on speaking terms that's cool oh yeah um so what's uh, what you know what's next for you are you going to get back in a car ever um you know i took I, in 2011 i said i was going to stop then and uh, we met roger burgess so i started doing the the turbo pro mod testing and invested a lot of time and effort into that. And then once we got that off the ground, I kind of stepped back again. And, um, I just, uh, kids were really young. Like, uh, okay. So it's my son would have been one in 2011 on December. And my daughter at that time would have been four. So it, it was just a time where the kids were really young. Um, there was a lot on my wife and I just decided, you know what, I'm going to do my best not to travel as much. Cause even when you go to the race, if you go on Friday night, Saturday, come home Sunday, that's one thing. But when you're there driving, it's like Wednesday morning to Monday morning, yep. you know, and it was just so much time between family and business that I had to just cut it off. And I pretty much have for the last, but really from 11, 12 to now, other than like, say Jose just can't make a race as far as on a Thursday to test, but Steve really wants to try some new stuff because Jose lives out of the country or the same with Sydney Frigo or whoever, I'll go to that event and at least get their testing in for them so that the tuner can, can get what they need out of it. And then I'll step back and either head home if I need to, or if I have the time, I'll stay for the weekend. So I still dibble dabble and do what I can, but I don't go and commit to races or anything like that. Yeah. But it's a cool story that, you know, I, I was telling these guys, you met Roger and, um, you know, that thing went pretty quickly for you and you got in a pro mod, you did a bunch of testing for him and then, uh, end up getting a driving gig at Indy and tell us about that deal. Cause it, it's first race you're ever at. Yeah. So the, we, we were, we did the 53 vet. And I just met Roger Burgess by chance through one of my other customers. Roger was wanting to do like a worldwide pro mod tour at the time. And he was really serious about it. He was going to take eight pro mods and go to the Middle East, go to Europe, go to Canada and come back home. And I was selling engines to a guy that was the manager of Yas Marina Circuit when they built it, you know, years ago. And we were down at PRI and Roger walked up and was telling us about what he wanted to do. And my customer was going to come back to Atlanta and, um, and come see our shop and stuff. And Roger said, well, hey, why don't you stop by my shop? So we did, and it's, he had that 53 vet sitting over in the corner as a rolling chassis, and it's, it had a 41 long block in it, just block heads and an intake like they had started to accumulate for parts. And um, we had just ran that 595 that, that November at the Streetcar Super Nationals, the first time we had ever went with Kobe Raven's car in Pro Street. It was the first Pro Street car on the five. So I had something to show Roger, so I didn't even know they were doing this. I didn't know he had a turbo car. He really didn't. It was like parts and pieces, and they had hired a guy to kind of – help them do it. Yeah, I remember all that. And they had to let him go. Yep. And it just was sitting over in the corner and they were running all blower stuff with Al Billis and Bob Newberry. Yep. And, um, I just handed him a business card and said, Hey man, like he showed us around the shop and we said, thanks. And I said, Hey, if you ever want to do something with that turbo car, let me know. And about a week later, he shot me an email and said, put me a quote together. We did. He sent a check and then it all started. And we were kind of the, we were kind of the redheaded stepchild at R2B2 because it was a sea of blower guys. And you had these turbo guys over here with a turbo 400 and a wedge motor where they're all Hemi and Linkos and clutches. And they all thought what we were doing was literally crazy at the time. 
And uh, we were kind of, they had like a whole full race shop at R2V2. And we were kind of over in the little, like, where his show car sat mm-hmm. because we weren't part of the crew, you know? Yep. And, um, and we, it was cool. We knew, we knew our place. So we tested that car for, man, six months. I mean, we were, we were still in that mentality of, and I still do today. It's like, you always try to go in with a customer and like, you don't, I want to, I want to be as budget minded as I can, but still give them results. Well, back then we were still young at it. So we're like, man, we know we need this converter and transmission, but let's see if this one will work. He's already spent the money, you know, and you spend three, you know, 50 runs trying to figure it out. And you realize, man, we just, this isn't, this ain't going to work. And we knew it, but we just didn't have the confidence back then to tell the client, especially when a guy's giving you an opportunity, you, we were trying to save him all the money we could. Well, then it had a certain turbo and it had a certain this. Well, finally, I'd say, I ain't going to lie. I'd say we put a hundred runs on that thing and over a six month period from July till the end of the year. And I remember we went down to West Palm in January and it was, we used to always do those pro mod winter tests, winter warm ups down there right after the fuel cars would go every January. And uh, we go down and we're like, you know what? Let's borrow a turbo 400 from Jose and let's put it in here with a converter we know works and just see what happens. We put it in and the first rip, it went like 613 at 238. He's like, oh, it's on. This thing's going to run. You know, so we go back out and we go 608 at 242. And then we go six flat at 246. And he's like, man, I can see what it's taking to speed up. We're about to lay it down. And I'm like, all right, you know, so we're all excited and we go up to the starting line and take off and we literally skipped the five nineties and we went five eighty eight with a zero at two fifty five. Hmm, and crazy. he wasn't kidding. You know, so oh it was just insane. And everybody there, all the other teams, it was kind of a shock to us. And you can think if it was a shock to us, it was really a shock to them. And it kind of changed the whole persona of the team and how we fit in and so, you know, we, we, we gained our you know, we, we uh we gained our spot and um, we all race together and we have really good relationships with all those guys to this day. And because of that and me helping Roger kind of get all that going. And, you know, I know, ne- I never, me and Steve were so committed to making it happen. Like we barely charged our time from when we were doing it. We just wanted the opportunity and, um, you know, old drag racers, you know, we always, we always fall for the, for the sport. So we, uh, we, <laughs> yeah. we forget about the finances of it when it's in the moment, you know? So we ended up to pay me back. Roger's like, you know what, we're going to get this. He was building a car after car. And he's like, when we get that Mustang done, you're going to be the first one to drive it and you're going to race it. And it just happened to be ready for Indy. And we went to Atlanta for one night. We made about five hits on it and we made it go six flat at, I think, 248 or 246 um, on like the fifth run. And um, we literally put it in the trailer and headed for Indy. And we had some electrical gremlins because it was a brand new car. And I think we qualified with like a 597 or something like that in the middle of the pack. And I got to race like all the big ones. I got to race Kenny Lang first round. I raced Tricky Ricky. He hung me, he hung me out all seven seconds on the tree. And, you know, to them, I was just this young kid that was in a turbo pro mod that nobody knew who I was. But, it, it, you know, for the la- that five years before, I probably made 1,500 runs in a twin turbo big block car that made more power than the one I was driving. And seeing Key Sabo and all these people, like, you know, cut me in on – what it takes to be a competitive drag racer. Yep. And I'd seen all the scenarios, you know, they just didn't know that. So tricky, tricky Ricky held me out all seven. And I think I cut a 30 light to his 70 and we outran him. And then I ran, uh, I had to run Melanie Troxel in the semis. Well, that was our teammate at the time. And it was a big deal for Steve. Cause it's like, okay, you're here just to drive for the weekend. This, I'm, this girl's a hired driver and she's, you know, she's why I'm here is my job. Yeah. She was our, our two B2s number one car, right? Oh yeah. 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 And that was a 53 vet. Yep. And, um, he's like, man, I want to be fair. I got to do my best job to make sure you guys run the same. No crap. We went out there and went, I forget to the number. We literally ran to the third number, the exact same ET. Oh, we geez. went 584 <laughs> with a nine and lit both scoreboards up. So it had to be one on the tree and you know, you could never do it again, but it happened. You know, the first time with the team cars that had to run each other, especially me being there and I really wasn't supposed to be there. It was a favor. He did the, I don't know how he did it, but we ran literally identical ETs and Magic. we had to win it on the tree. And I was fortunate enough to leave first. And then we ran Castellan in the final. And, um, yeah, first race, first NHRA race I ever entered, I left Indy with a Wally. So that was, uh, that was phenomenal. That's a crazy story. That's one of the, that, it was. That, that's one of the best racing stories ever. It really is. It was awesome. Yeah. And we had a cool story this year when a, a, a guy that we met at RTV2 used to work for Scotty Cannon, um, his name's Brandon Stroud, and he's been the car chief on Jose's car since 2012 when R2B2 decided to get out of Pro Mod. And uh, he's kind of been Steve's right hand man. He was his 
kind of co-tuner, co-crew chief on the Jag's car when Jag and uh, TJ were both, I mean, uh, Troy and TJ were both running together. And really every car Steve's been heavily involved in, Brandon's been right by his side. And so he's got to see Petty's moves, how he works, what he does. And Steve really took him under his wing. And another kind of, you know, fallback on that indie deal, Brandon got the tuning opportunity to take over the role of tuning Sydney Frigo's Pro Mod at Indy this year. So the first NHRA race that he became a tuner, he won. And, uh, and that, was, that, was, that was Sydney's first Wally was Indy for, as a Pro Mod racer. So it was kind of cool. I told him we can share the same story one day when we're two old grandpas telling yeah. the grandkids what we did. Yeah, that yeah. is neat. So um, it, was, it was really neat. So <clears throat> ProLine today, what is, what is the primary – I mean, is there a primary class that you guys work with? Like, is there a primary type of motor or is it across the board period? It, it is. It, it's gotten really, really, um, we've really narrowed it down. So it's, it's, we do Hemis and 41Xs. Um, I would say that 80% of the motors we build are Hemis and 41s. We started with the 41 at R2BT. That's how we even became, we didn't even know what it was until we met Roger and, and found that motor. Back then, we were big block Ford, small block Ford guys, big block Chevy. You know, we didn't know what an all billet engine was. We'd never even seen one, probably. Um, and so we do those 41 still to this day. We love them. They're one of the most durable, um, just easy to work on, handle a lot of power combinations you'll ever buy, and they're very cost effective. And then we do Hemis because inevitably in NHRA, they've limited us to a boost number. So when you're limited to a boost number, it's all about how efficient is the engine to show the least amount of restriction in the manifold. So the Hemi in that sense is better than the 41. But then if you take the boost controller rule off and run both engines wide open, they're within a number or two of each other. So it's just, if you go run a set of 88 on a 41 wide open, they might make, let's say 50 pounds of boost. But if you run them on a Hemi wide open, they might only make 44. Well, if they say, okay, the boost rule is 43, Obviously, the Hemi's only going to lose one pound, so one mile an hour, and the 41's going to lose six. So we still run a lot of the 41s in your grudge race, no prep, radio versus the world, LDR, all those small tire type classes. Um, the Hemi has started to make its way in radio versus the world, which is Andrew Aleppa and Dwayne Mills. They've been helping us R&D it, and we've been through our trials and tribulations with it, but we really feel like now we've refined the combination. So they're going to run that you know, this weekend at Ducks Race. And, and NHRA, it's exclusive Hemi. Uh, PDRA, exclusive Hemi. Um, anywhere where it's really serious, heads up, big tire, um, it's gotten to be the Hemi's taken over. Um, but we're still not, a lot of the reason it happens in Pro Mod is because even though in PDRA, a stage 441 be, would be competitive, most every racer is like, well, if I'm going to build one, I want to build something that I could possibly go run NHRA with. So we end up just building Hemi's for all the Pro Mod stuff. So that it crosses over. Yeah. So you're not um, locked into so yeah. just one type of competition. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So we got those two. And then one of our biggest customers, I would say over the last, since the day we started ProLine, because they were a customer before we ever started, our most consistent, largest client of overall of ProLine is Underground Racing. They've, they've been an absolute, just wonderful client of ours. Great relationship. We started building, uh, I don't know if you got, do you guys remember Race Parts Distributors? Yep. In North Carolina. Yep. So they were the RDI, the small block Ford guys. Yep. So they referenced underground because they were in Charlotte at the time buying parts from them because they built Celine S351. That was their first little gig they started with. That grew into a customer having a Viper. And over the years, we built a lot of Vipers for a long time. And then that grew into a customer having a Lamborghini about 2009. And since 2009, we've been doing Lamborghinis as fast as you can build them ever since. And um, it's just been a great client. And they're a lot like us. We share a lot of the same similarities as far as like how we tune, how aggressive we are, you know, in the market and marketing uh, aspect. Like we both run our businesses very similar, so we kind of benefit off each other. But they've been a, they've been very fortunate, but they've worked hard for it to stay at the at the top of their market. And even if somebody comes up and knocks on the door, they always answer the call, and they're always there. And uh, that's just, that's that's been something that uh, some people know about. But a lot of people don't know that we literally build Lambos every day. So, you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, think there's that many of them. Uh, I mean, we still say the same thing to this day that not only would there be not not be that many of them, but how many people want to put twin turbos on them? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you sit you there and you, you you do like kind of the basic math, like when you're trying to figure out what's the potential of this business. 
and you say, okay, look, there's this many Lamborghinis or approximately or what we think, and this many people would want to mess with them. And this many people would want to mess with them at the level that we'd like to mess with them to make money. It just, right. that math, wow, it just doesn't seem like it should work. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and to give you an idea, I mean, there's at least one being assembled every three to five business days. There's one complete engine leaving, ready to leave Proline, at least every three to five business days. Holy so shit. they'll pick up six, they'll pick up six and drop off six and it never stops. And now what's happened is this half mile stuff has became so popular. It's no different than a heads up pro mod. So these guys will have a Lamborghini that they keep at home with pump gas that makes 1200 of the tires that they can drive around and go to dinner with their wife. And then they have a Lamborghini, they leave it underground and it's a, it's, it's still turnkey AC power steering, drive it to the hotel and back, whatever you want to do, but it'll also go from a stand stop to a half mile and 257 miles an hour. And they just set the record the other day. And, those cars, the motors are ran really hard. It's still a Lamborghini engine. So you can imagine in a 3,000 plus pound car, what it takes to go 257 and a half mile. I mean, they're running trap speeds in a quarter of over 180 miles an hour from a dead stop on street tires. So you can imagine what kind of power they're putting through those engines. So when they get done with an event, if they break it or not, because of the load that we're putting on it, they'll, you know, they'll bring them back. We'll check them replace anything we see needed, put them back in the car. So not only are we building new builds, we're doing race rebuilds at the same time. So it's, it's, that's really sped up the business and the flow for us because um, we're trying to keep up with that, with that part of it for them too. And, and they do such a good job. A lot of the stuff that comes back, we don't really, we don't really have any issues with, but um, you know, we did a billet block for them and uh, that car is the one that went out and went 257. It allowed us just to push it that much farther. Um, so it's, what those guys are doing in the business they've given us has just been, it's tremendous. They're and I got, I got to imagine it building primarily engines like that. Uh, you know, if that's underground's deal, you're not dealing with broke racers. <laughs> you no. Know? no, no, no. And they're, they're consistent. You know, we, uh, they've been good to us. You know, we don't ever have, that's the one account that you don't have to worry about. Um, you know, when you go to bill them when or how, or, you know, they, they've just, it's just such a great relationship. And, you know, Doug, I was telling you the guy, he, he's such a, huge part of our business like he's that machinist that everybody goes to well if you don't know just ask doug so doug over the last we'll see from nine to now so you know eight nine years doug is the only one that has assembled every single one of those lamborghinis so we've built i would say with new builds and rebuilds for over 300 and doug himself has up until two years ago, he disassembled everyone and assembled everyone and did all the machine work. I'd say until two or three years ago. And now he's gotten comfortable with, you know, our cylinder head guy does the cylinder heads. The block guy does the block work. Um, another guy does the teardown. But Doug still, he's so passionate about that account and his relationship with those guys that he's assembled over 300 of those Lamborghinis in the last seven or eight years. Wow. Hey, we got to switch gears a little bit. We, had a, we just had a listener yep. ask, um, what can you tell us about the new small block in the Murder Nova, if anything? So that's a that's a four and a half inch four space pro stock engine. Um, you know the old pro stock truck stuff. Yep. So where that stemmed from, it's actually a really cool story. So the Pickett brothers had a motor at Proline when I took it over, and it was a Chuck Newton block. It was ahead of its time by a long shot, and it's just the Pickett brothers at the time got those opportunities to do the Trick My Truck show and some other stuff way back then, and their attention went away from racing for a while. They had that Nova that they raced 10-5 with and the coolest 18-wheeler rig you could ever imagine in a racetrack. And they ended up parking all that stuff and saying, you know what, let's concentrate on these TV shows and all this stuff. Well, their motor sat at Proline literally from probably 2002 up until last year at PRI. Me, Sean, and one of the Pickett brothers was at the Drag Illustrated CI party, and we were all talking, and we're like, you know what? Like, he needed a motor. He wanted to do something lightweight, alcohol. And I was like, man, we should see if they want to do something with this small block that you still have here. Him and Pickett were able to work out a deal. So we knocked all the dust off of it and pulled it all off the shelf. And we assembled uh, that motor. There was still pieces missing and some stuff it took to put it together. But it's a billet Chuck Newton block. It's, um, you know, a big stroke small block, four and a half inch board space with an old set. They were still brand new, never been ran, pro stock truck heads. And... You know, we had a, um, he had a, uh, had a manifold with it that Brandon Switzer was really good friends with all those guys that, that they had made for it, but it was too tall. Sean wanted to keep that, that factory OEM look and keep that low profile hood. So Sean had a manifold made for it from Hogan's and 
um, yeah, I mean, we, we put everything we know today and what it takes to make the power today into that older engine. So it's got the updated rods, pistons, crank, you know, valve train that we know what it's going to take for him to go out there and beat on it and not have to worry about it. But the, the, the bones of the motor still came from pro stock truck. Um, but it was just a tall deck deal. So it, it had a lot more room for stroke where a pro stock truck would have been very short deck and, um, you know, high revving deal. So this is a bigger stroke, taller deck. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool story behind it, but, um, that's, that's where that motor stemmed from. And we're just curious, what head is, is that one of like the cannon valve fault stuff? The late stuff? Yeah, the guys, oh, I wish not. Now, I was just thinking about it because I remember the logo on the front of the head because, you know, it would have been the only one that we've ever used. And it was like a bullet. Um, and I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Slocko? did those heads back. What was that? Slocko? No, the doesn't... company's name is what, what, ring, what rings the bell. But either way, it was a cast. So it would accept water. Yeah. Head for a four and a half inch four space pro stock truck that you know that, that somebody big at that time was doing yeah i was thinking cfe was probably who it was but it doesn't matter it was and it was like yeah we'll figure it out at some point there you go mike hmm. you said tech i'm still bothered by the the lamborghini thing i can't yeah. believe there's that many out there well yeah <laughs> it makes I mean, me feel like a failure dude like, I, why don't i have a couple of them know, sitting here you know i told you a story i went to eric long ago to try to get in on that lamborghini stuff and you know they were looking at our stuff and uh you know, we balked at it, and that was kind of because how many could you ever sell? Yeah, I would have said exactly the same thing. Kind of a little bit of a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> on on those yeah, particular crazy. ones, what like what did you guys find with the factory Lamborghini stuff? Like how? I guess the term what I'm trying to use is how robust were they? Like what would they handle? in a relatively factory form and, and how did you find the weak links? Like, and what were the weak links? Really what you would think out of, out of any of your, you know, mod motor LS, you know, the rod, the piston, um, over time, way over time, the lifters became an issue, but that was way down the road or let's say followers. Um, just, just, they're so strong for what they are. It is, it is the most impressive motor out of LS, Ford, anything we've ever messed with. You know how we haven't got really big in the Coyote stuff because our business kind of shifted the other way away from the streetcar market. But at the time, you know, we were doing small block Fords, modular engines. Um, we did the Hemis. Um, we kind of got into all that stuff. And it, it overly impressive what these engines could handle if you just put a set of rods and pistons in them. And then, you know, over time, they just kept pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope. And we started putting more and more and more parts in them. And um, now they've gotten to where we're going through a lot of the stuff in the engine. But at the end of the day, to give you an idea, they took a new Huracan when they first came out. This was, I don't know, maybe two years ago. And they went to the drag strip and ran it with a completely stock engine and just had a turbo kit on it just to see what they could do because they just got the turbo fab done on the new Huracan. And they're like, well, let's take it to the drag strip, see what it'll do. We'll pull the motor out, send it to the Proline. Well, I have to go back and look exactly but the car went like 180 miles an hour in a quarter, <laughs> like with a completely stock engine. Now, when we got it, the rods were bent. It had pushed it, had pushed it to its limit. Yeah. But no matter what, I think the thing went like, I want to say the thing went like 820 or something. Ridiculous. It already had all the clutch, training upgrades, everything. The only thing it didn't have yet was the engine because they were working on all these other things for this combination. And the engines were so similar, we could have got it last. Everything else was more important. And, um, yeah, they held up. Like, you can take a stock engine and make decent power, but, you know, one little hiccup is going to go bad. Yeah. But they had it. They know the tune-ups. They know what it takes. So they push it to the envelope one time, and that gives you an idea of how strong those engines are from the factory. They need to be more built to be durable than they need to make more power. They just need the durability to handle those two turbos. But that's got to be around 2,000 horsepower to go 180 plus uh, those aren't really light those cars right no it's uh it's insane what they're making now but i can guarantee you it's it's 50 percent more than that yeah you know i know i know what they and make and now they're, and they're doing it and they're doing it with a cast you know at the time cast block cast head factory engine just insane like what more like what john mahovitz is doing you know yeah taking a mod motor and just pushing the last yep. envelope yep. that's what they're doing yeah, well, uh, I'm actually kind of involved in that because we're on the other side of it with the GTR, and that that yeah. that fight yeah, exactly. that that fight's been going on. You know, we had the yeah, the record last year. You guys got it now. You know, so you like uh, English racing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, English just crushed it. Through. But yeah, not. Yep. We, we don't do much with them. We we have AMS and uh, uh, Boost yep. Logic and T1. Yep. It's fun. That, that deal is fun. The, the GTR Lambo battles is you know what's kept it going so strong for the last few years. It really is. Got to be good for you know. I know it's great for you because yeah, yeah the what, Lambo guys want to be on top. It's all going. What what yep. displacement are those things? The Lambos. Well, you, you got a five liter and a five two, and they all keep factory stroke and dimension. So yeah, the five liter and a five two. Same engine in the uh, the Audi R8. Yeah. 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 Yep, so we do a lot of Audi R8s because it's literally the exact same platform. Yeah. So what's uh, what's next for Proline? You got anything new? Any, um, anything exciting? We've been we've been working as crazy as it is, you know, because we're used to doing all this big twin turbo stuff. We've gotten to the Pro Charger stuff. We did a we did a screw blower EFI deal for Pro Extreme um, last year, just because we wanted to experience it, and um, um, it went well. I mean, we 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 weren't the front runner. Um, we were middle of the pack. It was our first year ever trying to run a screw. And first time ever putting EFI on a screw blower. And, you know, first pass down the track, we popped the blower and leaned it out. And um, it was totally my fault. I tried to make the combination look pretty and put two small fuel lines on it from what we had on the dyno. And Petty wanted to kill me after we figured it out about three or four races <laughs> later. But because um, um, pretty to him don't matter. Fast is all that matters to him and, you know, what, what it makes to keep it alive. So I caught, I'm still catching heck for that one. But, uh, um, you know, that, that, that worked really well. And what it taught us is all the characteristics that a blower car has to offer. Um, very consistent power control, being able to do it with just timing. Um, zoomies, how much, a lot of people don't understand how much tuning aid that a zoomie brings into play. The downforce that a, that a zoomie on a, on a very powerful blower car gives to you is such a huge tuning tool that we knew it was kind of do a sense. And, and no doubt, Billy Stockland led us onto that. Like, hey, guys, you know, this is where you're never going to get it because you don't have this downforce tool that we have with these blower cars. And then when we did that, we're like, well, let's just build one. Like, like, let's see what we're missing. So we did the blower car deal, and we took the same chassis that, that Q80 had went and went 546 on the quarter, and we'd been 359 to the eighth. But our best, our best 60 foot ever was 940. I think we went 939 maybe one time, and a consistent 60 foot was 950 and 960, let's say, in perfect condition. It was way worse than that in the heat. So we built this blower car. We didn't touch a strut, shock, four length, weight, nothing. Motor location, we just converted it to a screw blower. We go out and we smoke the tire, smoke the tire, 915, 905, 895. So within five runs, we've been at 890, 60. We've got, at that time, probably, hun- I mean, a thousand turbo pro mod runs. Never been better than a 939 once. Hmm. So the only way that happens is they both have the same power, same weight same chassis, same everything. The only difference is downforce. So if you take a turbo car and put it on the two-step on a set of scales, that turbo car is going to put zero amount of weight on those scales, on the two-step. Sometimes it actually, if you got big air scoops in the hood, it pulls all the air volume away from the top of the hood, and it actually goes from base weight to negative 15. Get Are the you hell out kidding of me? <laughs> oh, that's yep. insane. So, so what, happens, what happens is you can turn that thing up to 35 pounds of ooze, 5,000 RPM, doesn't make any difference. It does not care. You you take you go stand next to a blower car, a nitrous car, the drag strip, and you feel the impulse of the cylinder in your chest. You feel it. Yeah, you know I mean, so you go stand next to a turbo car. All you're doing is feeling a hair dryer. Yep. Because every bit of impulse from that exhaust is being dampened by the exhaust wheel, and it's completely gone. There's none left. <clears throat> yeah, so you're using the energy of the up. exhaust to turn the wheel. Exactly. So until that engine gets up to six, seven, eight thousand RPM and thirty, forty pounds of boost then you're starting to see downforce come into play and given that turbo car a tuning tool, but it's not happening until 200 feet down the racetrack. Well, we need it in the first five feet. So if you take a blower car chassis and a turbo and, and set them up the same, a turbo car will go out there and go straight to the wheelie bar and ride the wheelie bar forever, where a blower car will p- push the front and end of the ground on the two-step. It'll push the front struts down 200,000, the rear 50 to 75, and when you let off the trans brake and all eight cylinders light, it'll actually push the front end farther down and then try to pick the front end up for a little while and push it back down because of that downforce. Well, that same weight and four-link package in a turbo car, you're going straight to the wheelie bar and smoking the tires. So when you're tuning a, a same weight turbo to blower, a turbo guy has to move weight, ballast, for every condition he runs in, every track temp, all these different things. It's moving this, moving that. 
So we learned so much off that screw blower car and how consistent and how much easier it is to tune. And I'm not going to say a screw blower is easier to tune. I'm talking about a blower car in general for a guy that comes to Proline and says, man, I want to, I want to go run no prep and I want to go, you know, be consistent. And I've never had an EFI car and I just want to learn, kind of get my feet wet and get out there. Oh, Pro Charger. No question. Because for us, a Pro Charger forces air in the engine the same as a turbo. So it uses the same intake manifold, the same injection setup, the same everything. I mean, you could take a turbo car apart and make it a Pro Charger car in a week if you had the parts. Um, where the screw has a lot of different characteristics and roots on how they want full fuel entered and who has the best blower and who has this. That's not our world. And we, we've, we've decided on the Pro Charger thing. And over the years, Pro Chargers kind of got put on the back a little bit in the heads-up market. So what's happened is they've gave weight break after weight break after weight break, trying to let the Pro Charger cars be competitive. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the rules the way they are now, they actually are fair. But nobody's coming out with a latest, greatest Pro Charger combination to take advantage of those rules. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> Radio Versa World, Pro Boost, NMCA Pro Mod. I'm not talking about the little tire classes. Pro Charger still hauls butt in those classes and wins championships. And they, they, they've got it figured out for those guys because a lot of your entry-level racers want Pro Charger because it's very easy, like I said, to get going. And it's a combination. It's still hard to figure out how to make it fast. Same with a screw or a root. So I'm not taking anything away from them. We had nothing for Jason Scruggs' 220 with our 210 or 212 vest. We weren't the leader screw guy. We just learned a lot from that combination and how, how, how well it was as far as power management. So we've pushed a lot on Pro Charger lately. We've got top dragster setups. We've got one coming out in LDR. We've got one coming out in Radio vs. the World. We've got one coming out in Pro Mod. And I've got one coming out. And uh, I said top dragster, but we got an NHRA setup. And we have a PDRA because they're not limited to a ET in the A. So we're doing a lot of Pro Charger stuff. It's newer to us. But for us, it's something that you can build dyno and ship it out the door ready to go with a tune-up so for a turbo one of our tuners has to come out they probably are going to have to come out with you for the first six months so you get familiar with how everything works in the combination because too many things on a turbo car one reaction causes another reaction so like there's there's a lot more to learn with a turbo car and how to tune it than there is a pro charger car so um that's what pushed us to do some pro charger stuff because we have a very small group you know, it's big in our market, but a small group of tuners. So say I have five guys that tune exclusively for Proline. Well, once they sign a contract with Jags, L General, Michael Beely, and all these top teams, it takes up a lot of their time. So for me to go sell somebody a turbo combination and not really be able to give them the support, it's not fair as a vendor from us to not be able to give them what they need. So we're very limited on now, we're very limited on what we can sell anymore because we have a lot of really good clients that, this, that our tuners are stay very busy with. And it's hard. You can't just get another, throw another tuner out there at the level we're at now. Cause one mistake can be a $30,000 engine failure and just one pass, Yeah, you know? So you have to have a certain amount of people. So we've kind of capped at where we can be right now. And that's not the only reason we did the pro charger thing. It was a lot of things lined up at the same time. You know, the, the, we're in a good place where we can keep a lot of inventory. So we can get these engines out quickly to people if they need them. Um, we have the support on the pro charger side. I have a few guys that can go out and support that. Um, the market's showing that the rules have came to us on the pro charger. So that's kind of one way we're going. Um, the other way really is just making the business more efficient. I mean, we've, we've got about five race teams that we keep in house. They're all international. Um, so their tractor trailers, their crew, the whole deal, they stay inside. At Prolina, we manage their team, their budget, um, not only just the race engines, obviously, but the whole operation. So we've got about five teams that we do that for. We've got the engine shop, and then we've got our part sales. And between those three, there's, uh, there's about 26 people that work inside the building, and there's five tuners that works exclusively for us. So, you know, we're, we're, on that, we're over 30 employees now, and it, it keeps us uh, that, that 30. Got to keep you busy. Out. It keeps us busy, and, and we've got the business right now to keep that, that crew busy. So we try to be very, not selective on who we sell to. I try to be selective on making sure that when the next guy comes on the door that we really have what it takes to give them what they paid for and follow through with it. Because the worst thing would be to sell them this $100,000 engine setup. Because when you, when you get into these, it's over hundred grand by the time you buy the motor, 
fuel injection turbos, piping, transmissions, tranny coolers, you know, everything it truly takes to make this car turn key and go run down the racetrack. And if somebody spends that kind of money and doesn't have the support at the end, that'd be the worst thing for ProLine. So we've, we've really regulated now. We've had to regulate what we can do. Not because we want to, you know, I'd love to sell another motor, but I'm not going to sell something that I can't support. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when you're in this kind of game, you know, the customer, you know, not being happy or not running well, you can't just say, well, look, you just don't know what you're doing. You you have to yep. do this. You you are responsible yeah, mm-hmm. for, for making them sure. make you look good. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I think somebody told me, I forget who it was, one day, but one of my mentors was like, just remember, every engine you sell, that's another marriage, and you're married to that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And true. you got to pick up all those phone calls, and you got to be there to support it and talk and communicate. And it's funny because it really is that way. Luckily, it's what we love to do. So, you know, as long as, my, as, long as, as, long as you know, you have the time to manage it all, you, you enjoy it. And I enjoy still getting up and going to work every single day, but, um, it is, it's a lot of, that's what people don't see. It's like you sell something in another industry. Every time you pick up the phone or go out to support them, it's a hundred percent billable, right? Well, in, in drag racing, it's not, you're out there a lot of the time, just on your dime, on your phone call at night. And luckily it's what we love. So it's still, I'm not complaining about it. It's just the industry that we're in. And, and I, I still absolutely love what I do every day and I get to do my hobby for work. You know, it's, it's awesome. That's great, man. Hey, before we wrap it up, I want to I want to wish you luck on something, and I'm sure the listeners want to hear about this. So, coming up, you got um, two cars racing for world championships. Give us the the short version of that that deal, and uh, I'm gonna wish you luck in advance. I'm gonna see you out in Vegas, but tell us about those two. Okay, yeah. So, Steve, the two cars that he's contracted to tune for the year, one would be Jeg, and um, they've had a very successful run over the last five to six years they finished we, we teamed up with jegs in 2012 and every year they finished either first or second which in that class as hard as it is to qualify and as competitive as that class is it wasn't done because of you know anything other than just great teamwork and and a lot of dedication to what they do so they've been very fortunate and worked hard to get to that point and here they are again i think they were three races back they were 12 rounds out and they've made up those 12 rounds we just had another rule change which the rule change, you know, I mean, the cars, if you look this weekend, some blower cars qualified better here and there, but on race day, everybody was within a number two of each other. And, um, they were able to earn the victory with some whole shots and, um, you know, some really, really close, good drag racing. So they were able to take that 12 depth, 12 round deficit and turn it in one round ahead. And with Jose Gonzalez, we run his car in PDRA pro boost. This is the first year since he's raced with us, which he has for a long time. He was the first race team that we ever took in house and, tried to manage he gave us that opportunity this was the first year that he was able to actually commit to a full series because his business and family keeps him very busy down in the dominican and he's like you know what i'm going to go after this year and really try to run for a series so we did and you know we we stretched the points lead there and we had a a sensor go bad on this one race and pop the top off and pour fluid all over the racetrack and we had to bow out and we had one race to where um we had one more mechanical failure and then a lot of races are just great competition. I mean, that, that, that class over there over the last few years Tough. has gotten so competitive. Oh, yeah. It's two, three numbers spread the whole spread of the field. So um, Jose's been just, he's a phenomenal driver. Um, Steve's very fortunate. Two, two guys that he's working with right now are just great drivers. He's a great tuner. we got good teams that have been working together for a really long time. And that's what I try to explain to people. These teams that are going for a championship have been teamed up for five, six years straight. And um, so we're going into both races with, we're one round ahead, or no, sorry, three rounds ahead with Jose or one round ahead with Troy. And he's got the opportunity going into his last two races to win two championships with two separate clients, which I thought was a really cool feat. That is really cool. Uh, but yeah, we're, <laughs> we're real excited about that. Well, good, good luck with that. And I'll, I'll see you in Vegas. Um, you know, we're about to close it out. Tell, tell, and I want to thank you, uh, for coming on. Oh, it's been great. You, I appreciate y'all bring, let me come on. Um, give us, uh, give us all your contact information. So listeners, if they want to get into the, into the outlaw world or, or PDRA or any of it, or they their Lambo off. yeah, yeah. Or do that. Yeah. So just, you know, ProLineRacing.net. Um, we had to, we had to stem our phone number off the of 41 X cause we love it so much. So it's seven, seven Oh four, eight, one, eight thousand. And, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, any, any, anything anybody needs, if they need help or, you know, advice or, you know, we're, we've always been about that. You know, we're here to, we not be able, might not be able to sell somebody something, but I'm still fully committed to what we do and point somebody in the right direction and make sure they get, you know, to a good shop that can help them. So, um, no, man, I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, 
it's, it's, it's definitely been a, a really long, um, cool path to go down from being a young kid that, you know, lived every night. Unfortunately at the time it is what it is. I was street racing and to go from that to, you know, to, to the opportunities that I've had right place, right time to get to where we're at today is just, uh, I'm still humbled by it every day. It's just awesome. Well, it is awesome. A matter of fact, I think Tom and I both told Luke, there's nothing you can't do. That's right. It just depends how hard you want to work at <laughs> what thing you're trying to do. Yep. And uh, that's true. It's, it's, it just takes time. You got to be willing to put in the time and learn how to manage it and still have your life. And that's, that's the hardest battle I've had. And, um, um, and you just got to keep working at it every day. Yep. All right. Well, again, man, uh, get back to your family. We appreciate your time and you coming on and, uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Sounds good, guys. Thank All right, you man. So much. All thanks, right. Eric. See you, thanks. Later. Later. That's tough for me, man. I'm out of my depth. Yeah, but good story. I, like, I, it's all good stories. I like, found the, the, the boost going negative. That is, it, is incredible. Yeah, that that's amazing. Cool. Very cool. That's something that I wouldn't have ever expected. Me neither. Ever. And, you know, I've heard that in Top in, in top Fuel and Funny Car, that it guides the car down the track, but oh, I, would, yeah. I wouldn't have thought of that. And it, that'd be cool to measure. Well, I know that like when these things, like if they lose one header. Oh yeah. They, oh yeah. They're all over the, they go, they they'll, off. Hit the, they'll go to the wall. Yep. It's crazy. And I mean, then I guess you get into like the angle. Uh, oh, it's all gotta be yeah. scienced. You know, cause if you remember them, you remember them back. In I'd the, want them to move back in the day when they would. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I, <laughs> variable pitch. Yeah. I'd want them uh, to, to yeah, you, you know, oh man. Variable volute. <laughs> hey, huh. somebody was saying on chat room. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Oh no! Look who we got here. These guys had the roughest drag week in the world. They did. We gotta get these guys on. Team two six zero. What's up? What's up, guys? What's going on? We're really sorry we didn't get to meet all you guys, but apparently you had your hands full. Yeah, we were. We were just a little. We were a little busy most of the time. <laughs> To say the least. So where were you guys uh, when we were at Byron? Um, Pretty much, like, as soon as you come in the entrance and turn right, we were right there changing my engine. Yeah. After, like, I made a pa I made my pass and got it done, and a few of the other guys got our passes done kind of while Nick was gathering up uh, the motor and the, and the hoist and all that shit, and then uh, we reassembled, yeah, over by the <laughs> entrance gate. <laughs> <laughs> jeez jeez yeah i i followed the circus one of the 130 or two well d yeah. just tell everybody real quick what went on with you guys like what was the first problem because uh, i was trying to figure it out did you hurt a motor or did you hurt a flex plate what actually happened so first uh, the the tragedies began sunday at testing most of us were like it's been such a rough season a lot of us weren't even going to test on sunday in fear of breaking something because we've done it all year. And then, uh, I think Nick decided to go ahead and make it. Most of us ended up making a pass, but yeah, on the first test pass, uh, Nick came back and it was smoking a little, wasn't it, Nick? Nick. Oh, did we lose him? Nick might be. <laughs> he's putting another motor in something. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, <laughs> That's all these guys do. <laughs> so how many times do you have motors in and out of that thing? All right, Nick should be back. Nick, you back? Yeah, I'm sorry. My phone sucks. Come on, man. Okay. So, yeah, we we hurt number one. They he came back from making that test pass, and it was smoking. And, he, you know, Nick, he was pretty upset at the time. And I was just like, well, let's pull plugs. Let's figure out what the deal was. And uh, those plugs haven't been out in a while, so it took, like, literally a half-inch breaker bar to even get them out, <laughs> along with half a cylinder head. A while. Yeah. So they were never out. Cool. The plugs were never out. Not often. Not often. <laughs> so we had number one end up being just coated in oil, and it was it was dead. We we had the old heat gun out there checking it, and yeah, it was a uh, confirmed uh, dead on arrival. So you know, we used the magic of for once social media was like the best thing ever, and it really was for us all week. Um, we got on there and went live on Facebook and and started asking people, you know, do you know anybody around here? We need a, we need a junkyard motor. Uh, you know, what, can, what does everybody have? And, uh, luckily there was a guy, somebody knew somebody and found Craigslist ads or something. And 
We hooked up with a guy local that delivered a four eight for three hundred bucks. I think we got it for delivered. Yep. He was yep, right there. Delivered. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yep. So by the time he got there, we had the motor out of Nick's car already. We worked in the, in the pit road there and just yanked it all out. Well, you know what? I got to ask because I'm still confused about the oil pan picture. You had a broken oil yeah. pan. <laughs> What was that all about? I mean, if I looked at it quick and I was doing something or getting phone calls or whatever, and I figured it was, you know, a rod came out, broke the pan, but that's not what happened, right? Correct. No. It well, was, uh, okay, so that was two, two, okay. Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, so that was Tuesday. Uh, Monday was when we had the flex plate issue. After that, we got hooked, uh, somebody hooked us up with Alana sure from uh roadkill and in ferguson they were having a local news station that wanted to do an interview with some drag weekers so she we got hooked up with her we talked to her we were going to take mine and adam's car in there and uh talk to her so we split off from the group later monday night stay at the hotel we get up we're going through a construction zone and uh there's a bump sign and so i i slowed way down because i know my pan hang low uh, there, you know, I went over this itty bitty bump that I really didn't have to slow down for. So then I sped back up, uh, here comes another bump sign and I'm like, well, I'll slow down a little more. So I slowed down, I slowed down, but not as much as the first time. And that, that bump was a little bigger. I was like, okay, no, no big deal. It, n- oil pan couldn't even been close. So then the third bump, I didn't even hit the brake. I just powered <laughs> right on through it. We were trucking along and it, uh. It was like Hiroshima went off under my car. <laughs> oh. it, was, yeah. it was nasty. It was one of those where like the road goes down and it's kind of V'd at the bottom and that's where the bump was. So it just <laughs> when you got to the bottom it just slammed the whole car to the ground. Yeah. Straight up roller coastered it. Yeah. It was nasty. I I thought we might be okay and I kinda of looked at my co pilot and was like, I think we're all right. That was nasty and <laughs> The whole car filled with smoke, and I can <laughs> we just pull over. And yeah, I'm b- I'm behind them going, oh shit, this ain't good. Because I mean, it just turns into like Uncle Buck driving down the road behind them. I mean, just smoke everywhere. Yeah, and you had to see oil, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you trailing them. I think it. Yes, exactly. It, it, so it took a minute, I think, for them to realize, but instantly his car was just covered in smoke from the back. And it was like, yeah. oh shit! Like, because you know, keeping score, we, yeah, we're Tuesday. This is Tuesday morning at seven a.m. We've already done a motor swap, and then the converter next day, flex right? Plate. We did the converter flex plate Monday night, and didn't even leave the gas station till eleven o'clock p.m. And and we were still four hours away from the hotel. So oh, I mean, yeah. it was going to be. That's like why a we were night. on ass that morning because we had the ground to make up, and we we called it a night at. A, Two thirty or three because we just couldn't sleep anymore because we had literally had no sleep from Sunday. What was it? Saturday. Yeah. Night. Yeah. So. Sunday we didn't go to bed till about five in the mornings when we got done. We fired the car off about five a.m. and then slept for a couple hours and got up. Yeah. And then that was, then after that it was just not an issue. So we had to get some rest and then we were hauling ass and then that happened and we were just like I was like Adam you go do the interview. I'm done I'm like this is this is this is the end of the line. I'm not even mad about it. We had a good run, and then of course, <laughs> fate had his hand in things, and it takes Adam ten minutes to change his mind to get me going again, and we can do it. So yep. it was it was it was crazy. So and it really was one of those like all the bad luck we had. Every time we did, we had good luck in the fortune. We found people that were so willing to help us out. Yep. Um, you know that was the, that was the cool part of it. Yeah, Mike wanted to drive around and look for you guys just to help you wrench on the car. I'm sorry, what was that again? I said Mike wanted to drive around and look for you guys just to help you wrench on the car, yeah. but we you know, we didn't know where to look. Trust me, it wasn't any funnier <laughs> the second time you said yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it. Was. Hey, oh my gosh. That's, you know, I'll say exactly what Dozier said. When I seen that picture of you, I am I'm with him hundred percent like, this dude got long hair? He is one of us people, but you don't seem like you would have been one of us. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's kind of funny because up until I did, I did a lot of business traveling up until probably the tail end of 2000 and probably 15, right around there. And I was, I always had long hair 
I mean, like real long hair. And then when I got, when I got involved with, you know, having to deal with a conventional business world, I couldn't look like, you know, the homeless guy, the homeless guy. (laughs) Now, because I haven't had to go to trade shows and my guys handle most of that stuff now, I was like haircut. And when I get around to it, don't care, which is never, (laughs) but I I was going to, I actually, I swear to God, I was going to get a haircut the day that we were going to go. Yeah, We both were. And they were closed and I'm like, son of a bitch. So I said, well, fuck it now. It's Mike. Here I come. <laughs> you wouldn't have cut it all off anyway. Dude, that's it didn't matter. We missed you because I totally expected you to be walking around in like a suit. That's what Dozier <laughs> said. What I don't, the fuck? I don't even understand that. The, the suit, suit part, thing. Yeah. I, and you know, I guess it's kind of like maybe a a a, a sad uh, prejudice that you think people that are always at some, in some type of professional business have to look that way when it's actually really cool to see they're just regular people. You know, you know, look. My dad had long hair his whole life, so my hair's always kept nice and tight. My old man always had long hair, and it's just like he didn't give a shit either, and that's just how he was. And it's cool to see that other people can be that way. Well, I, I got to tell you, from from that perspective, the first, the very first trade show that I went to, I was Mike, but shaved, you know, nice, clean shaven, you know, but you know, very long hair in a ponytail. And you could tell that people didn't really want to talk to you. Yeah. It it really it it's it's bad, but it makes a difference. It's their prejudice. As a matter of fact, there's there's a guy I can't remember his name now. It'll come back to me. Um, God, that eh, fuck it. But anyway, a guy that knew one of the sales directors that I worked with. Yep, he was there the very first trade show I went to. I went to the next trade show, and he says to the guy, he "says Mark, who's that?" And he goes, "That's Mike." He's like Mike from last year. And he goes, yeah, what happened? <laughs> He's, he, he looks crisp is what he said. Engaged. He got religion. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. I, I, I hate to tell everybody that because trust me, I am the guy that would raise his fist to conformity. If I had to, uh, it ain't going to work. <laughs> you, you get, sometimes you got to look the part. You just got to. So, yeah. but yeah, that's who I am inside is probably most, most represented by the pictures. Because I, I just don't give a shit. I guess I looked like everybody thought I was going to look. Well, you got you had pictures of you like in a plane seat, and you're in the manly catalog, and we said you look like goofy Tom Selleck. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, you know, we. I guess everybody, and you know. You, I don't look homeless. No, you don't look homeless. Yeah, yeah. I handled that for both of us. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> well, that's, uh, listen, I, I wish we got to meet you guys in person. I mean, we, we met Chris. Yeah. yeah. You know, we got to see him. Yep. But, man, what a what a rough week. Yeah, and, you know, that was, we got done doing that oil pan finally, and we, we're going to the track. We're just going to make it in time to get passes in at St. Louis, and we're trucking down, I think it was 55, and it's like a four-lane deal and really busy, and we're, we're, we're going like 80 mile an hour, and I hear a noise, and I look back, and my little trailer doors, had they fly open, and my, my co-pilot's suitcase and shit had shifted, and knock the doors open. So it ejects his suitcase out the back. My Jack goes out the back. Jack stands, I mean, so yard sale right on the freaking highway. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit. We pull over, you know, try to get the car stopped as quick as we can. And my son rode with me all week and he's 10. And I'm like, dude, do not get out of this car no matter what. And uh, being my co-pilot just takes off like Forrest Gump sprinting and all the shit's laying in the middle of the highway. And we snatched it all up and, and found almost everything. Luckily, his suitcase didn't open, but it just got road rash pretty good. And the old Harbor Freight $59 jack didn't hold up too good. But <laughs> we gathered it all up and slammed it back in the trailer. But it was just like, come on, give us a break. Yeah, how much more shit could have went wrong? Wow. Oh, man, yeah. And then, yeah, we leave the track and the other motor takes a shit, you know, from the whole oil pan deal, I'm sure, running out of oil. And so, yeah. It, it was a hell of a week. I wouldn't definitely change anything about it. I mean, no, no I wouldn't change it for anything. I mean, hell, even even after we got the motor that's in my car now, the smooth running. Band, I mean, I it's like Cadillac now. I didn't. We were just hanging out when we went to Great Lakes, and we were gonna leave at a regular time, but we didn't really know what to do doing that. Our buddy Jason Taps was having a few issues. So we were like, well, we're not going back to the hotel yet. So we didn't help Jason tear down his whole motor, the whole top yep. end of his motor. And hell, we stayed there till six or six o'clock. Cause it's like, what are we going to yep. do if we get to the hotel at a decent time? We don't need to go to bed. We 
you know, it's the last day of drag week. We don't want to end it on a, on a slow note. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, it was it was it was a neat thing to experience to see like the work and the aggravation that goes into it. I mean, we kind of knew what yeah. it would be like, but yep. boy, you guys uh, talk about stuff going on, man. <laughs> that's <laughs> they had it all. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, well, but, you know, yeah, it's all about trying to fit. We weren't going to let it beat us, and I think that's what drag week can turn into is like, can you beat it before it beats you? Can you, you know, yeah. can you get through it before something happens that just turns your will against you and you just don't want to go any further. Yep. Well, maybe it was all your bad yeah, luck for yeah, all the drag weeks to come yeah. in one week. Yep. No, I've done two, two drag weeks before this year. Never had one issue. I never had to work on my car once. Oh, and so, it, so it, it was it, karma it then. Up to me this year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it all caught up to me. All right. Well, what do you guys got going on race wise? I saw something come across. Why don't you plug your stuff? Yeah. Yep, uh, this Friday, uh, we have our, our Heads Up stuff again at Muncie. Uh, Doc, Old Street Beast, and Doc, and then John and Jody Jr. are both going to be there. Um, the weather doesn't look real good right now, unfortunately, so we, we do have a rain date for Sunday, uh, but that's happening this Friday. I'm, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a track rental test and tune in the morning for some guys. Also, we normally have a pretty decent group that will come do that, and then uh, they'll stay for the, the evening festivities. So, yeah, we got that one this, this weekend, and then the 20th is our last heads-up race of the year at Muncie, all the streetcar stuff. And So, yeah, it's been, been a real good year. We're, we're planning hard for our neglection race again next year. I know Brent's really excited at Lions for us to come back there and, and do that deal again. So we're finishing out strong racing almost every weekend in uh, October and then finally a break. Yeah, gotcha. When does the weather get bad enough in that area that you got to say, okay, that's it? You know, you can pretty much make it through October, but yeah, November, it hit, it's hit and miss sometimes, you know, you might get a nice weekend, but it, you can't get into the evening very far. If you're during the day, it's not too bad, but kind of that end of October is when the party's over. Yep. Gotcha. All right, man. Well, hopefully we can help steer people your way. That would, uh, that'd be yeah, nice. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So we always try to promote yeah, you guys. Yeah, if we have enough time to plan next year, maybe we can get out there. I'd like, I'd like to get out there one of those things. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm not opposed to to jump it on a plane and go in somewhere. It's just, I, I got to have a few minutes of non craziness. Yeah. That's all. You just have time to get your haircut. <laughs> I will get my haircut. I, that's, haircut. Listen, that's what I said to Tom. I said, next time I got to go to one of these places, I'm going to put my suit, my suit roll up. I'm going to get a haircut. I'm going to get all cleaned up and we're going to be walking through and be like, what happened to Mike? Nobody's going to wreck it. Here I am. You'll be looking like my driver. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be no good though. Cause you know, at the racetrack, them, those people, we're okay with the long hair and that guy. You know, yeah, they'll be scared. More looks in that suit. Yeah, yeah, right. Weirder in the suit. Be like, what the fuck was this guy? Like a yeah, DA fed, guy or fed? fed? Yeah. Looking for stolen auto parts? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's cool. You come there all laid back. You know? Yep. <laughs> well, we'll definitely meet you guys at one of these things for sure. Yep. For sure. For, yep. Yeah. Heck yeah. All right, guys. Well, everybody that's out there, support their race if you're close. Um, Get there. They, they got a good thing going on. Really, you got to go help these guys. Get, get, get your ass to their tracks. All right, man. Well, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. You're welcome. See you guys. Keep up the good work. Thanks. All right, man. Thanks. See you, buddy. Bye. Nice guys. Yeah, I would like to get to meet them. They sound like they're fun and just regular cool See, they, they were there, but I mean, I think that- They were at Byron when we were there? I guess so. They said they were they were in the front, but they were working on a motor and doing all this stuff. So, I mean, yeah, you know, the last thing I want to do was go fuck with somebody. Like poor PJ. You know, he was over there. He had all sorts of shit going on. Yeah. You know, I just want to come over, say hi, see you later. And Dan, you know, Dan Nissen, he, yeah, yeah. he was leaving. Need to get his trans well, done. We, you know, we had a lot going on too. You know, I didn't get CJ's and Hoots. You know, we didn't, we, we kind of didn't walk through the whole place. You know, we were, well, whatever. We did what we did. Yeah. Next year it'll be, it'll be easier. All right. Some part of it will be. All right. Do we got anything lined up for next week yet or no? No. Because I think I do. Oh, good. So. What is it? I don't want to say anything yet, all right, but I think on. I do. And I think it'll be good. And I'll tie in with, uh, with, you know, kind of all levels of performance. Oh, so cool. We'll see. Well, we're going to start. Uh, yeah, I, I do have a plan. We'll talk about it off the air. Okay. So. Yeah, we got, we got to get our shit together. I know. That's the biggest problem. I'm busy. You're busy. Uh, Tad. <laughs> I'm busier than all of you. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, we got to, we, we got to do a couple things. I know. No doubt. But we'll get it. We'll get better. So. All right. Anything else? Or is that pretty much it for... I think that covered us. All right. Everybody get swifty. All right, Ted. Everybody get what? Swifty.
I don't even. Come on, you should know what that is, Mike. We're ending on that. I guess so. (laughs) All right, so we'll be back next week, Monday. You're not going anywhere, are you? Nope. All right, so you're going to be here. So you're going that half-mile thing, and then you're done. Yep. All right. All right, see everybody next week. Later.